How are we doing? Already? Uh, good afternoon. We're here today uh, to talk about how we intend to address the racial. I see my friend here with a camera. Are we all set or not? Sorry. <laughs> myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> That's usually my job to mute myself. Already? Great. Uh, good afternoon. We're here today to talk about how we intend to address racial inequity in our state. Uh, through the next legislative session and the next biennium and beyond. Uh, but before I get to that discussion, I'd like to quickly highlight a, a proclamation I signed uh, today that is intending to protect the hard and vital work we're doing now in our local health districts and pausing efforts that might adversely impact that work. Uh, this proclamation puts a pause in effect on efforts to terminate a health district or a city county health department, such as what is currently taking place in Pierce County. This pause is necessary to ensure that we have a continuity and stability of our public health efforts throughout this pandemic. Uh, there are exceptions to this pause. Uh, a joint health department or health district would be allowed to terminate their agreement if uh, all of the parties to the health jurisdiction agreed to the termination, or if a party wants to terminate the agreement, uh, they could obtain, uh, if they can obtain approval from the State Department of Health. Uh, this pause will allow public health workers to focus their energies on the most challenging chapter yet of our pandemic response. It removes politics from public health, which at this moment would be a reckless and dangerous course because we need these public health folks totally focused on vaccine delivery, efforts to prevent the, the spread of this pandemic. Uh, they cannot be uh, frustrated in that work by extraneous debates. Once this emergency is put to rest, then we can reflect thoughtfully with all of our communities about the best ways to ensure a stronger public health system in the future. It's important to note, I am not taking a position on any of the proposed changes to the health district, but right now these districts are launching the extraordinary task of disseminating vaccines and we can't distract or demoralize the staff or undermine public trust at this precarious moment. Lives and livelihoods depend on our best performance and that's what we need to deliver. Now, on to a discussion of equity and our constant pursuit of justice. Um, the crisis of the past year, the crises of the past years, both in the area of, of uh, public health and in racial justice, have made even more apparent the confluence of long-standing inequities in our society. The consciousness of the nation, nation has been raised in the last several months against inequity in many forms from criminal justice to the economy, from environment to education, and to the provision of health care. And we have a moral mandate here in Washington State to acknowledge these hard truths and lay the solid foundation needed to correct these long-term injustices. As I previously said, Black Lives Matter. Our commitment to equity also extends to indigenous and all people of color in our state. I firmly believe that Washington State is an anti-racist state. and I will be taking actions to hold our state government to that commitment. We need our policies and our budget to reflect our dedication toward disrupting the harmful systemic cycle of racism and equity. We've seen uh, uh, all kinds of folks uh, suffer uh, disparity in health results and in the COVID pandemic. Infection rates amongst uh, residents who are Hispanic are almost three times higher than their numbers represented in the population of our state. And this COVID has exposed long-standing racial gaps in income, health status, occupation, housing, food accessibility, and other social economic factors, all of which have a common root cause, which is racism. So now is the time to implement real change that will have a positive impact on the lives of those most impacted by this crisis. And today, we are committing to make investments to help all Washington communities thrive. 
especially communities of color that have been marginalized for too long. These proposals are important steps in the right direction, but we acknowledge the massive work that needs to be done to right the decades of inequity. Uh, now, I'll be talking about some of the specific policies uh, to uh, incorporate equity and justice. You'll hear more about equity every day this week while we're rolling out my proposed budget. Uh, we'll be rolling out our climate, economic, education, and health policy and budget proposals, as well as some of the things we talk about today. We know we have to do better, and we have to do more. This is the time to expand our commitments and investment, which is why I'm proposing to a budget that includes $365 million of equity-related policies and budget items. I'll be joined by Representatives Melanie Morgan today, Representative uh, Maya Gregerson, and Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler to talk about some of the legislation that is uh, allied and supportive of these budget requests. But I am proposing to increase Washington's commitment to equity in many, many ways this session. One of the things we can do is to make a firm statement. We intend to do so by supporting legislation that will make Juneteenth an official legal holiday in the state of Washington. Observing June 19th as Juneteenth will uh, recognize the significance of America's history of slavery, the vestiges of which continue in the oppression from institutional racism that remain today. It will be a somber celebration of the resiliency and spirit of black Washingtonians. It is said that those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. In Washington State, we want to highlight that history to effectuate positive change for all. With that in mind, I'd like to turn over comments to Representative Morgan. Thank you, uh, Governor Inslee, for those strong words in addressing inequities and disparities across the state. My name is Melanie Morgan. I represent the 29th Legislative District, which is part of South, South Tacoma. We did a great thing this last summer in the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. We all came out, we protested, we shouted in the street, and we loved your support. And so these next steps that we have to do is actually take it to the leadership and the legislature, and the next step is policy. And so that's what I'm bringing about is racial reconciliation that I believe all of Washington should celebrate the end of an atrocity that we had in this country of slavery. We have lots of support from the Washington State Labor Council, from the Teamsters, and some members from the King County uh, uh, Council as they try to pass a Juneteenth holiday locally. We also have many organizations in the Black African American community, the Urban League, the African American Commission, the uh, NAACP, who are also behind this wonderful piece of legislation. I ask everyone to stay tuned, track us on ledge.wa.gov. This is House Bill 1016, and I look forward to this, for us celebrating this as all Washingtonians together as we further um, to tear and dismantle racism, and we fight for equity, inclusion, and diversity. Thank you, Representative, and thanks for your leadership on this. It's just been of great value to our legislature to have a, a real champion on this. So thank you for your alliance on this. You know, uh, we know, as uh, Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But it doesn't bend just by itself. It takes work, and it takes organizations. And that's one of the reasons we are uh, advocating a, an addition to our state's organization to be specifically committed to equity. So today I'm proposing $2.5 million to fully fund our state's equity office, which was created by the legislature this past session. This office will be composed of eight people and will develop and implement a five-year equity plan for the state. Will also assist agencies in developing their own diversity and inclusion plans. This office will create an online performance dashboard that will monitor agency progress toward goals set out in the diversity, equity, and inclusion plans in order to keep the arc of the moral universe moving forward in the state of Washington. To talk more about that office, uh, we have Representative Gregerson. Representative. Thank you, Governor Inslee. And 
I want to thank uh, staff also for the years of support and the commitment to this work. The legislation and an idea is a collective of so many people. I do want to thank the work of the task force. Most recently, they took us around the state and we heard from so many diverse voices. And I think what rings true now more than ever is that the data tells us over and over again that we aren't, we aren't serving the most vulnerable and the most marginalized communities well enough. And that it's not overt racist practices and policies, but it's about looking at all of them to identify and implement effective, well thought out approaches. This office will bring expertise and accountability to these efforts. Now we all know that COVID-19 has made it even more apparent who we need to support and we need to make sure that we're with them through to recovery. So I'm very excited for your commitment. Thank you. And I'm excited to hear that the executive director will be starting soon. Thank you again for today's event and to show our commitment and the promise of this office. Thank you. And I should note, uh, Representative Gregerson was the sponsor of the bill creating this office. Thank you for your leadership. I think it's gonna have some great uh, effect. Uh, this year highlighted the shortcomings of our criminal justice system in a number of way, ways. And we know the legacy of racism has existed uh, in many places, including in our criminal justice system. So I'm also requesting legislation that will recreate another office, the Office of Independent Investigations. The legislation will see that investigations of police use of force and prosecutions are conducted fairly, transparently, thoroughly, and through an anti-racism lens. After the officer-involved deaths of George Floyd in Minnesota and Manuel Ellis in Tacoma, I organized a task force to gather input from community leaders law enforcement and family members on how the state can improve the independence of our investigations and in the decision to prosecute or not to prosecute officers involved in violence. The recommendations uh, have shaped this legislation. I'm proposing $26 million in, the, in this biennium for the creation of the office. And we believe this investment is not only fair to the community, dis those communities disproportionately impacted by police use of force, but also necessary. And it will be adequate to fund this in the independent investigations and prosecutions as appropriate in these matters. And we know that we have uh, folks who uh, are part of our community, who uh, are working really hard in many industries, including agriculture, that have been hit hard economically as well as physically by the COVID pandemic, but who are not today uh, eligible to participate in the support systems for families that are, not, that are otherwise available because they are not documented. So they're working, they're paying taxes, their kids are studying hard in school, uh, they're coaching soccer, but they're not participating in the support systems that they need so much. So this upcoming session, I will also recommend an additional $10 million for the Washington COVID-19 Immigrant Relief Fund. Immigration status cannot be what stands between a person and shelter and food and safety. My office worked to set up this fund earlier this year with input from stakeholders across the state. This $10 million will be added to the $40 million previously allocated and another $22.6 million recently requested from the legislature, which would bring the fund to $72.6 million. This fund is a vital resource for hardworking Washingtonians who are immigrant workers, who are otherwise unable to access most economic supports that have been available. And this is important as well to all of us. It will allow more workers to be able to afford to stay home when they're sick, which means fewer workers will be exposed and they will expose fewer people in the broader community when they're positive for COVID-19. So this effort will help, help to minimize the COVID pandemic as well as help these families through these troubled times. It's important that we work just as hard to serve a crucial Washington community that works every day uh, for their neighbors. And this fund is gonna bring much needed relief. 
We also need to look for other ways to right the injustice in commercial activity. And we have a proposal to do just that in the insurance business. I'm also supporting legislation with Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler that would ban the use of credit scoring in auto, homeowner, renter, and boat insurance rate considerations. This bill addresses systemic racism within the credit system, which disproportionately affects communities of color. And I want to thank uh, Commissioner Kreidler for his leadership. He has been pushing the ball on this for some time with great courage, as he had in so many insurance-related uh, issues. I want to show a, a graphic as to why this is important. This graphic behind me illustrates the different insurance burdens according to people's credit scores. People with poor credit are expected to pay more than twice as much as those with excellent credit, and often they still pay more even than someone with uh, excellent credit whose rate went up for being charged with a DWI. So you'll see that uh, uh, if you end up with poor credit, you got to pay more than people who are even uh, convicted of driving while under the influence. When that has nothing to do uh, the credit score with your driving history. So I'm glad that we've had the leadership of Mike Kreidler on this, and with that, I'd turn uh, this over to Commissioner Kreidler. Thank you, Governor. I think people would be shocked to know that for 20 years, the insurance industry has been using credit scores to determine how much you pay for car insurance and homeowners insurance. So I, I am indeed pleased that we can come in on this uh, together. Uh, when. When people find out that they they are are using credit to determine how much you have to pay, not not because they're they're worried about whether you pay for your insurance, they're looking at it from the prospect of whether you're going to file a future claim, and they're using that information to make a determination as to what you pay in monthly premiums. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, it's unjust, it's unfair, uh, it is especially hard on people as they struggle with the devastating impacts of a pandemic that we're going through right now. Uh, people with lower incomes and minorities are the hardest hit uh, uh, by the economic and, and uh, health impacts of COVID-19. Uh, they are watching during the first trial. At the same time, we rely on them as essential workers. And we're charging them on seeing them charged more to maintain essential activities, such as being able to drive a car um, because they need to have car insurance. Uh, this, is, this is indeed unfortunate that uh, we have this kind of situation. What causes people to have uh, a loss of uh, in their credit scores? Generally, it's because of unemployment, natural disasters, and uh, unexpected medical expenses. That's exactly what we're looking at right now, except we're looking at, and that's what's being driven up right now, and the credit score is going down. This is a, a requirement of the insurance of, of society uh, by virtue of needing a car insurance uh, in order to drive a car legally. And if you have a mortgage, you better have homeowner's insurance or the bank is going to uh, force issue into a, a, in an awful lot more. So you together can take on this very vital issue to, to, to do something about credit scoring in the state of Washington. It is long, long overdue. It reminds me that in the 1960s, there was a long time form of, of housing segregation. They called it redlining. You know, as a society, we made a determination that that should be banned, and we did. But redlining was banned uh, because it was a form of systemic racism. And what we're looking right now with credit scoring, it perpetuates that form of systemic racism uh, by virtue of what it does with insurance. That is a truly unfortunate and regrettable that that takes place in the state of Washington. Insurance companies pride themselves on being committed to social justice. 
it is time for them to step up and make the change that's necessary here. They, they hide behind a secret formula. They won't make their, their determinations public. So you can't even go and look and find out what they're looking at, much less how they're weighting it in a particular uh, premium that you're having to pay. We have a chance to fix that. We're going to propose that to, we are proposing that to the legislature. Uh, insurance companies need to step up and make sure that this is equity for all. Live up to the promises that they've made, their spoken commitments that they've made. Actions speak louder than words. Washington State needs to step up and do the right thing. It's time to ban credit scoring in the state of Washington. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, and I'm joining the insurance commissioner, but I want to give him uh, the, the credit for, for being the driving force in this effort. You can sense the tone of Mike's voice that he gets the inequity of this. He has been a champ for consumers throughout his career in this office, and now he's a champ for equity and justice too, Mike, so thanks for your leadership. Uh, finally, today I'm proposing new equity investments in our capital budget including formation of grants investing in community-based organizations that serve ethic, uh, ethnically diverse communities. Uh, these investments include $400,000 in capital bonds for the Department of Commerce to create an equity uh, committee to develop strategy for equitable investing and policy, looking at individual and community needs of underserved populations. An additional $400,000 in capital bonds for the Recreation and Conservation Office to review equitable distribution of state grant programs to increase outdoor opportunities for all people. And in addition to the $800,000 in capital bonds, I will recommend investments in five specific capital projects across the state to support organizations such as food banks, community centers, affordable housing, and recreation in ethnically diverse communities. I think we have on our screen here some of the items we'll be uh, supporting. These are only some of the ways that we're proposing we begin the long process of dismantling uh, inequities in our society, replacing our aspirations for a better society with concrete action, which is what we're doing in this budget. We intend to disrupt the systemic racism that depresses economic growth in minority communities. We will invest directly in underserved communities, experience gentrification. We'll increase individuals' access to opportunities to stop this insidious cycle. And I've just mentioned some of the things we're doing today. During the next few days, we'll talk about uh, the need for increasing access to early child education so that our children of color can enter kindergarten and first grade without being behind. We'll be discussing the environmental justice that we know is important to embrace as part and parcel of our effort to defeat climate change. We'll have proposals to try to end the digital divide that has so disadvantaged many communities in communities of color. So what we've talked about today is just sort of a, a first installment of this equity issue, which will be threaded throughout our budget, as you will see in the next several days. Uh, I'd like to stand for questions, but if you can give me about three or four minutes, uh, I will be right back. If you can hold those questions, I shall return. Be right back.
excuse me, we have a few things going on today in, in our state government. I'm happy to stand for your questions. First question comes from Rachel with AP. Governor, how do you plan to fund these programs, and do you have plans to refund any of the measures you vetoed earlier this year that might fall under the equity lens, including the pilot program to review and vacate criminal convictions based on current statutory eligibility requirements? Well, we haven't addressed the criminal justice aspect of that specific item, so we'll have more to say that in upcoming days. But as far as how to fund this, this will be in our budget. We will propose a balanced budget, and this will be funded through all of the revenues from our state that come into the state of Washington. There's no specific revenue source designated for these particular expenditures. They will become part of the general budget. But I want to reiterate, that budget will be balanced. We'll, uh, we'll be rolling that out here in a few days. Rachel, would you like to ask a follow-up? No, I'm good, thank you. Next question comes from Joe with the Seattle Times. I, I may, let me just add something to Rachel's uh, second question. We will be uh, pursuing some additional criminal justice reform measures uh, this year, and this is not the exclusive list. Uh, I've identified the independent investigation and prosecutorial effort but there will be consideration, I've been in talks with legislators as recently the day before yesterday, about measures to bring more justice to our criminal justice system and get a less recidivism, which is our goal, which is to, to reduce crime. Joe, oh, you can ask your question. Governor, two-part question. Uh, what is, how are prosecutions going to work uh, under your independent office? Will they be referred to the state AG? And then, um, with uh, COVID-19 outbreaks expanding across Washington's prison, uh, community advocates have uh, been criticizing the um, efforts on the state to bring equity in there for uh, people of color and prisoners. Uh, why not find uh, more ways to release more prisoners to free up uh, space in the prison? Uh, uh, as far as the prosecutorial, we'll be working with legislators to determine the exact place to uh, locate the independent prosecutor. But I am confident we can get that job done. Uh, we'll have some further talks with legislators about what their views are on that subject. But the task force, I think, did a good job. I think we're well poised to get that independent prosecutor's office set up in addition to the independent investigation unit. So I feel very confident about being able to get that job done. It does take a few more conversations with legislators about the specific location of that office. It's important that it, <laughs> we do have a, a prosecutor to do that, and I'm confident that that will get done. On DOC, DOC this is very challenging. Uh, certainly we understand people's uh, families' concern for their family members who are in incarcerated. Clearly we want to do uh, what we can do to reduce the risk of COVID. We have already released 950 people who are incarcerated uh, several months ago, and we don't believe actually under the current status that it would actually uh, have a significant improvement of conditions. The department has a very, what I think is a comprehensive plan on how to reduce the risk of COVID. And I'm sure you can understand that that is a real challenge in a, in an, in, in a, uh, a correctional facility. But they have extensive plans about isolating people when they are showing symptoms, when they're COVID positive. They have considerable uh, efforts to use the cohorting model, which will reduce the number of people that, uh, that you're exposed to. They have an extensive screening process to screen uh, employees so that they don't bring uh, infections or to minimize the infections that come in, go into the prisons. And because of those efforts, they, they have been relatively successful. We just checked the numbers, and they are in the, the, the best one-third of all the correctional institutions in the United States, meaning they're in the bottom third of the infections per 10,000 people in their facilities. So they are having a relatively good success rate in reducing the infection rate in our institutions. That does not mean that uh, incarcerated individuals have not had some uh, some changes in their routine, and those changes in routine, I'm, I'm sure, are frustrating to them. But we're trying. I know the department is trying to minimize them as as far as humanly possible, 
And I would encourage those members of the press who are interested in this subject to sit down with the department and, and listen to their plans on how they're going about reducing this risk. Sometimes there are stories that are reported in our great insta media that just are not accurate. Uh, sometimes rumors get started by individuals who are incarcerated that are frankly false. And so it is important to, and I encourage people to sit down with the Department of Congress, uh, Corrections and listen to the protocols that they have embraced. Well, would you like to ask a follow-up? No, that's it. Thank you. Next question comes from Ted with King 5. If I can just add one more thing, too, if I can, Joe. Um, you know, we understand how uh, the communication issue is important here, too, to try to have as much communication as possible between the incarcerated individual and the family members. Most of them do have a messaging device to be able to do that. But I know the department is trying to seek every way to communicate so that rumors, and there have been rampant rumors that have turned out not to be accurate, and so that people's minds can be put at rest. And that is an important effort that is that is under, they're undergoing. Next question comes from Ted with King 5. Governor, how can the state properly investigate police um, use of force if officers are not wearing body cameras in many departments? Um, would you support a state mandate to require them to do that? And would you, would the state help them pay for it? Well, I think this independent investigation will help, uh, obviously. I'm open to consideration of those issues uh, and or helping communities. So I'm open to those ideas. I've not foreclosed them. So uh, Mark, B is, Mark B is interested in people's proposals uh, in that regard. I do think that the experience has been are relatively good in the departments that have uh, used this system. Uh, I was pleased to see in Tacoma that they're being added. So uh, I'm open to those ideas. Ted, would you like to ask a follow-up? Are those ideas, uh, are those just conversations at this point? Are those conversations even happening in your office? I haven't had one today. I mean, it, from time to time, we've given some thought to that. Originally, there was some privacy concerns about a, how to handle the digital information, the mountains of digital information. But I think we've shown a way to accommodate that. Departments have succeeded on this. Uh, I wouldn't say we're imminent to make a decision. We've been working on a few other things. Next question comes from Laurel with a spokesman review. Hi, Governor. I wanted to ask about your um, capital projects. From this plan, it doesn't look like there's any projects currently in eastern Washington. So can you talk a little bit more about how you chose these specifically and how you can work to ensure equity statewide if eastern Washington isn't included in some of these? I think Miller Park is actually in this. Am I, not, am I wrong on this map? Miller Park is uh, Miles Stompin grounds of, of Yakima is one place it's included. And I know legislators will make proposals as well. Laurel, would you like to ask a follow-up? Um, yeah, I want to ask about um, improving broadband connection, which I mentioned you might talk about later this week. But uh, will any of those investments go to help tribal and rural communities who often have broadband, broadband access and even other rural areas? We're going to talk about this in more detail, but I believe that all of these communities will have some benefit. Next question comes from Melissa with Crosscut. Hi there, Governor. I do have a question for both you and um, the insurance commissioner about the insurance rate setting that you use credits for. Uh, I have heard some, in the just recent days, some concern from uh, actually members of the Commission on African American Affairs um, that maybe this proposal doesn't really do that much for black people potentially. They want to see more data to see how it really will benefit financially um, these folks. Do you have any thoughts on whether this is, um, goes far enough to actually provide some assistance to black people in Washington State? Mike, do you want to take a stab at that? I'm not sure I understand yes, the criticism. Um, but my question, yeah, neither do I. But I, I, I would say this, uh, Melissa, is that uh, number one was said there that uh, 
if you're lower income uh, and uh, your income has uh, suffered a, a, set, a significant setback and your re insurance rates are going up, uh, that's a real problem. Uh, and if you you're, have a disparate impact on people of color, uh, by virtue of being in that lower income group that's going to be negatively impacted because of credit scores, it, it has a very significant uh, role to play. One of the key areas that people are concerned about that still have some, some um, work for themselves is being able to get to that work with their car. Uh, they need to have car insurance and they're struggling right now to pay for that car insurance and that's the difference right now is that we can make sure that they're going to be able to have a more affordable you know, car insurance as opposed to seeing it escalate because they were unfortunate enough to be lower income and caught in the pandemic and having economic pushback. That's my sentiments. If you're in the lower economic group, you probably have more economic crises and thereby you have probably additional benefit, and I think that does apply to most communities of color who, because of the disparate economic conditions, I've got to believe this will be a good thing. Melissa, would you like to ask a follow-up? I actually wanted to ask about schools. There's, it looks like in your policy brief there's several ways in which you're looking to increase equity in schools. How, how would you go about that, particularly for K-12 schools? as the effects of the pandemic may continue into next year, or just in general. What is your plan for improving equity in K-12 schools? Well, we talked about early child education, um, and we'll have more to say about that as we talk about uh, the budget. Uh, we have some things that we hope to be able to uh, get more of our children back to on-site uh, education. We'll have more to say about that in the next several days. So I'll have to reserve most of our discussion of that for a couple of days from now. We have time for one more question. It comes from Hannah Scott with Cairo Radio. Hi, Governor. I'm wondering, uh, what does success in these investments in equity look like for you? Uh, what are the metrics you might be using to gauge success? Because obviously just putting money into this doesn't guarantee an outcome. It's directional. We, we want to see the arc of the moral universe move forward. That, that's the measure of success in all kinds of measures, from being able to afford car insurance, to have health insurance, uh, to have a job, to have meaningful education, and all of these measures. And I think you've seen we have a relatively comprehensive approach to dealing with multiple aspects of, of how, uh, the, you know, racism have, have caused the ingrained losses of opportunity in our society. So I haven't put a, you know, goal lines like the 20 or 30 yard line but we are pushing that arc forward in all of these measures, and I'm glad we're doing that. And I'm not, I don't pretend to say these measures are gonna eliminate the vestiges of slavery, but I think they are significant, they are real, there's real dollars, $365 million be, uh, behind this effort. So this is more of a, not a rhetorical effort, it is a real effort to improve people's lot in life and give them a better shot. And I think it will help in, in, in quite a number of, uh, ways people's lives have been affected. And I don't mean to say this is anything um, disparaging of our great state. We got the best state in the country. But we have now had our, our, our minds lifted both to the shadow of, of racism and now in the opportunity to do something about it. I think that with all the tumult and trauma that we've had in the last year, it is an opportunity to take a, a big step forward towards justice. And I don't think we should lose that opportunity or let it pass without being ambitious. And this is a fairly ambitious agenda, I think. Hannah, would you like to ask a follow-up? Just quickly, Governor, on the eviction moratorium, I've heard calls for that as part of the equity conversation. I know the current moratorium is good until the end of the year. Any thoughts, are you gonna be speaking on that later in the week or any thoughts on extending that? We will have further discussion about that. We also are looking at uh, our next uh, economic relief activity. And again, we're waiting to see if Congress acts. We are desperate for Congress to act. Uh, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program expires on December 26th. If Congress does not act, 
we are looking uh, for ways to help in that regard. So those things are in consideration. Uh, we may not have clarity on what we will do until we find out what Congress does or does not do. And uh, we're waiting with, for, with bated breath for them to act. No, I want to thank uh, everybody who's been helping us on this. Uh, in design, I think a, a robust package to help us seek more justice. And it'll be a good day in the Evergreen State when we strike another blow against racism. And I think we had a great chance to do that this year. So let's go get them. Thanks very much.